This conference will now be recorded. Okay, good evening. Uh, I'm Joe Gallo from NCAN. I'm just going to try to give you some basic guidelines. I'll introduce the uh, Howard Walensky, who will be the moderator for this evening. Okay, sorry about the echoes there. First off, if you have any questions that you have answered by the speaker for tonight, please put them in the chat and then the moderators will, will pick them up and present them. Sometimes we need to do some consolidation as well. I ask that now if you would, to as a minimum, mute yourself, mute yourself, everyone other than those who are going to be act actively participating, to mute yourself. Uh, it's also advisable if you would uh, turn off your webcams because it does tend to become a distraction. People start to <coughs> excuse me, watch to see what it is you're drinking or, or looking at. Um, you should also be aware, as, as is typical, uh, there will be no medical advice offered in this session. Um, what we do suggest is that you do consult your own physician, even though our speaker tonight is a physician, uh, we're not going to be asking or expecting him to uh, uh, give any direct advice. And if your questions could be more generalized rather than to your specific case, uh, that would be preferred. And with that, I will turn it over to Howard. Oh my God. <laughs> well, it sounds like we're getting uh, some music from the Twilight Zone. Um, but but we we're, we're heading into the future here with our speaker. Thanks, so much, uh, Mike. That was good, Harry. That's why yeah. I asked everyone if you would please mute, uh, you know, or you'll find that I'll be coming around muting you, and I prefer that you would do that for me, please. All right, let's try it again. Sounds pretty good, or well, it sounds better. So, are there any other live mics? Because I'm still getting feedback. It's coming. It's coming from. So are we ready now? All right. Well, tonight uh, we're lucky to have uh, Nils Olson, uh, MD, but also military man, as our as our speaker. Um, he Nils. Uh, is uh, the chief medical officer for the D Defense Innovation uh, Unit in Silicon Valley. So, and he, he is working on potential future of pathology using artificial intelligence. Um, Nils is, uh, is a graduate of Annapolis with a, a degree appropriately in physics went on to medical school at Tulane University. And uh, he, he was trained as, uh, he was a resident in pathology at the Naval Medical Center in San Diego um, in both anatomic and clinical pathology. And tonight he's gonna talk about his, his path to doing this sort of research and uh, We'll have questions afterwards. So, Nils, um, assuming the sound is good, why don't you proceed? Thank you, and uh, thank you to Howard and Joe for putting this together and inviting me and and doing all the legwork of making all this happen. Um, and, and I thank everybody for uh, showing up. And um, may have some questions for you at the end of this as well. As a pathologist, I don't actually uh, get involved in the patient experience very often. Um, and sort of, uh, I'm your doctor's doctor, but um, this is an opportunity for, for you to hear about what I do, and uh, I'd like to think I hope to hear about what your experience is as well. Um, so I work in a, a space of machine learning um, as well as pathology, um, so it's just a presentation title. Um, and let's see if I can advance. There we go. Words I have to put out there, uh, 
views are expressed are my own, uh, do not reflect official policy or position in the Navy, Department of Defense, or United States government, and I have no conflicts of interest. Uh, no one's paying me to be here. Um, so motivation for this uh, project um, starts with me. Uh, before I started residency, the Navy uh, sends you out to do a tour as a uh, general medical officer. So you do uh, medical school, a one-year internship that's good enough to get a medical license, and then you go practice uh, primary care on mostly young, healthy sailors. Um, while you're trying to figure out what it is you're going to do. Um, so I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do and started going to lectures at Naval Medical Center San Diego. Uh, decided I wanted to apply to pathology and uh, went to the chief resident and said, hey, I want to do some research. He said, uh, sure, there's some uh, folks over here that uh, want to work with us and um, why don't you come over to this meeting on Monday. Um, and so I came to this meeting on a Monday morning and there was um, sort of the head of research for Naval Medical Center San Diego and his scientific director and the department head for pathology and the chief resident and uh, the president of Sanford Burnham, one of the major um, uh, medical research groups in San Diego. Uh, if anybody is like plays golf and knows where the Torrey Pines golf course is, uh, Sanford Burnham owns the uh, Pretty much all the real estate across the street from Torrey Pines, um, and the guy's name is uh, John Reed. Uh, he's also a pathologist, and um, he, you know, made the very sensible proposal that we had a thousand doctors and other providers, and uh, he had a thousand researchers, uh, but no hospital, uh, and we didn't publish a lot of papers, uh, and so that seemed like a good place to form a collaboration. Um, so I, the department head said, I'm not doing it because I'm retiring. And the chief resident said, I'm going to fellowship, so I'm not doing it. And just everybody looked down the table at me and I said, I guess I'll be doing that um, because I was trying to get into residency. Uh, so, you know, I, I was not the uh, special kid that was identified early as, you know, somebody who could do research. I was just kind of the right guy in the right place at the right time. Um, maybe minus the right guy part, but anyway. Um, so I started working on this research project, got into residency, and I was kind of part of the way into residency. And my dad knew I was working on this project, um, and I had focused on prostate cancer. And, and honestly, I focused on prostate cancer because it's uh, somewhat less popular than some of the other cancers. Uh, you know, colon cancer and lung cancer cover the entire population. Um, so you know, there's a lot of noise uh, around that research sometimes, and the breast cancer community. Uh, you know, I think if anybody's driven down the street, uh, they've seen a bumper sticker from the, uh, one of the foundations. So there's oh, there was a lot of energy around there, and I was like, yeah, I'm gonna go over to prostate cancer and, and just work in that space. Um, just so you know, if I if I make some mistakes, uh, fewer people will notice, um, and that, that was my thinking at the time. So anyway, uh, he he uh, I'm on a phone call with him. It's actually uh, a FaceTime phone call, probably popular with a lot of people these days. Um, but this is back in 2014. And uh, my what we did, we had a FaceTime phone call, and my kids were in primary school, and uh, we would do this thing where we would read a book and you know, my mom would read a couple pages and my dad would read a couple pages over FaceTime, right? And then I'd read a couple pages, my wife would read a couple pages and the kids would give it a go if they felt like it. Uh, and we'd just kind of round robin a chapter a week. And so we, re we had just finished up our chapter uh, of this book and the whole family is sitting around uh, and my dad says, Nils, I just got diagnosed with prostate cancer. What do I do now? I was just like, oh, Oh God, uh, that, that's a really great question. Uh, and I am now being a researcher, I'm sort of like, I'm certain that I don't know the answer. Uh, so that, that made it very hard to put this project down. Uh, and it's been, you know, what, seven years since then, and we're still chipping away at it. Um, 
but there's been a lot of things in my life along the way. Uh, so after residency, I, I did a tour at Camp Pendleton, um, which was helpful. Uh, I've got some research collaborations built out, but then I got shipped off to the Naval Hospital in Guam. They said, well, you seem to be you know, capable and able to practice on your own. So you get to go be the only pathologist in the farthest uh, hospital from the United States. Um, so I uh, got to practice pathology out in Guam and you know they're actually doing prostatectomies and prostate biopsies and the whole, whole kit. It's a full service uh, uh, pathology practice. Um, and you know, I, I'm the only one out there. And, you know, that it's seven time zones away from the West Coast and 10 time zones from the East Coast. So it makes uh, collaboration very challenging at times. But uh, it, it worked out, and it, interestingly, this worked out fairly well in some regards because I was already set up to do uh, remote collaboration um, and had all the tooling in place uh, before the pandemic. So when the Teddy Roosevelt showed up for uh, its, uh, yeah, I don't even know what you call that, uh, its uh, offboarding of people to, to quarantine for a month, if anybody remembers that back last March and uh, April, uh, it was pretty, th th this, there was this side effect of this research, um, I guess I should say. So I can talk about that more if somebody has questions, but we're not talking about COVID today. Anyway, so motivation is basically my dad saying I have prostate cancer in front of my whole family and that very public experience of trying to be a pathologist as a resident and, and being asked that question kind of sharpens the point. Um, so bottom line up front, uh, we're teaching machines to classify cancer. Um, the teaching machines part comes from the fact that again, my undergrad is in physics uh, and that covers uh, linear algebra, which turns out to be the core uh, machine learning thing that happens, the, the math of uh, teaching machines. Uh, uses linear algebra. So I, I knew that and it, it was just sort of the the zeitgeist of 2014, 2015 was that this machine learning stuff was blowing up. And so I I had the, I had a problem which I'll explain later uh, and it was obvious that this would be a good solution to the problem. Um, so let me, I'll explain further. So very simple basics. Um, you can read the slides. I'll, I'll give you a minute for that, and then I'll talk through the pictures a little bit. I think they're legible. Everybody can read that. Okay. Uh, I'm going to keep going here. Um, so the pictures, the upper left is uh, what we actually see for a prostate, um, from a prostatectomy, taking out the whole prostate. We cut it up into about 40 sections and then embed them in wax. So if you've been to a, uh, uh, a flea market or something, they have candles with leaves or something embedded in them. We have a very similar process where we embed the tissue in a wax block and we mount it on something called a microtome. And then in the upper right, you see the microscope slide. Uh, I wish I had a pointer. I guess I don't have a pointer. Maybe I have a pointer. Pointer, there you go. So there's a microscope slide. Um, <clears throat> so that, that's about five microns thick, which is actually thinner than a cell. Sometimes it's thinner than the nucleus of a cell. Um, they have chased a mitotic figure across three sections of a slot of a section before. Anyway, so um, historically, uh, the, the first whole slide imaging system that was authorized by the FDA for clinical use was in 2017. My project started in 20. 11. So we we're working on this before the FDA said it was okay to, to use for clinical purposes. But I was scanning this for research, and this is the first scanner 
I, I used with a collaborator of mine at Sanford Burnham. Um, this is a, a CS1 Aperio. Uh, he was a beta tester for the system and he said, you know, what we're gonna do is, is build a thing, a tissue microwave, I'll talk about that later. And what I want you to do is go ahead and scan all the tissue block or scan the slides for the blocks and just draw circles around where the cancer is just as a bookkeeping exercise. And me being a young resident, having not done research before, I was just too stupid to say no, I just didn't know. Uh, so I just drew all the circles, which turned out to take a long time. Um, and then he looked at the blocks of tissue and he said, well, these seem kind of thin. So um, why don't you get me some more blocks? And I had an intern working with me at the time and he said, well, how many blocks should I get? And I said, oh, I want you to get five per case. So that quad, you know, and tupled my workload to draw circles right then and there. Uh, a, a side comment I later regretted. But um, anyway, so we got all the circles drawn. Uh, and then um, the idea is that what you've done is you've coded information that this is where to find the cancer. Um, and so you can pop all that up and push it through, this is a Google uh, TPU system down here. You can basically do a huge amount of linear algebra with a bunch of computers uh, and train a machine. Uh, basically, a, a, it comes down to a, a file full of numbers uh, to identify what cancer is, identify all the features. So we did that um, initially, and you can see in the lower right our uh, initial attempt at building something that would look like a heat map uh, and if you look closely um, there are some uh, all the orange patches tend to be inside here and inside here if i recall it's kind of small right now but there was one somewhere in here that was also orange it was like uh, maybe the pep oh, maybe i missed it oh it's right here yeah i, I looked at that and I'm like huh, maybe i missed something so anyway, the other part of this is, is obviously that there's a big data problem. Um, and you know, these slides, this uh, slide I'm, I've got here is maybe in the order of uh, 30 gigabytes of data per picture. You have 40 of these per prostatectomy. Uh, that comes out to what, 1.2 terabytes? So am I doing the math right? Um, and then the whole medical center might produce, I think NMCSD was producing 350,000 slides a year. So yeah, this becomes non-trivial amounts of data. Um, the Department of Defense actually has uh, the third to fourth largest medical system in the country, depending on what you're counting. Um, the VA is the second largest. Um, and I'm blanking on who's the first largest right now. Anyway, so um, we have about 9.6 million people enrolled in the defense health system, the military health system. Um, and we uh, have a, there historically, there's an artifact called the Joint Pathology Center um, that houses 55 million slides collected from around the world. Uh, and then there's the, um, 50 or so medical centers that actually do pathology and they keep all their stuff for about 10 years at least. So you just end up with a very, very large number of slides. So you can imagine if you have gigabytes per image and 100 million of those images, that's just a lot of data you have to deal with. Uh, so at one point it was, you know, I, I did the math and it was just a lot of data. So um, if we, uh, Get, if we keep them for 10 years, it begs the question, what happens after 10 years? So we actually pay people to burn uh, the blocks and shred the glass slides. So um, there may be some better uses of that data. Um, let's see if I can, I have to exit my pointer. And my keyboard is not responding. So that's normal non-drawing arrow. There we go, okay. Um, so this is, uh, cross-section of a prostate gland from the apex. Um, the green circles 
are my annotations that uh, this is where to find the cancer. Uh, in the middle is the um, intraprostatic urethra. Um, the vera montanum is this uh, region uh, in the in the back where you got these little horns. This, oh, you guys can't see my uh, pointer again. Okay, so this is this is the urethra. This is where the urine passes through. Um, and these marks out here are a pathologist indicating where they kind of the bounds of where they saw cancer. But this is from Apex, and it's a little bit small, so it's fortuitous that it fit on a, on a slide. Um, and feel free to interrupt with questions here, but we're going to zoom in on uh, this area right here. If you can see, there's a little orange or purple dot that's smaller than my cursor that we're going to zoom in on. Um, yeah. right, so we're going to zoom in again. Okay. So my job as a pathologist is knowing that this stuff on the right side is cancer and the stuff on the left side is not cancer. And uh, you might be able to see there's a pink line. That, that line is the line that on the other side is green. Um, and you can tell, you know, my lines are not perfect, right? But I, I included some small amount of normal tissue inside there. Partially it's because I drew the lines at a lower magnification. <clears throat> and I wasn't drawing from for the purpose of teaching machines. I was just drawing them as a bookkeeping exercise. And I'll, I'll show you why in a little bit. Um, but what you see about the normal tissue, uh, we'll take this gland right here. Uh, everybody can see my red dot. Hey, Nils, can I ask you something quick? Yep. You know, what are the, <clears throat> the cancers that are here? Uh, you know, what are the Gleason scores on those? Yeah, so that great question. Let me start with the normal. You guys can see my pointer? Yep. Okay. So this is a normal tissue, normal prostate gland. And uh, what I see if, if I kind of go across it, I have stroma, this kind of pink uh, protein material. Uh, and then I have one cell, and then I have a lumen, the space in between. And I have another cell, and I get back to pink. And I can do that with this one too, right? Pink stuff, stroma, uh, cell, open space, a cell, and then I got pink stuff. And, and you can kind of do that on all of these. This one, it's uh, tangentially cut. So uh, kind of you, you cut an onion near the top, it looks a little different than the onion through the middle. Uh, so you have a similar problem over here, but this is still a normal uh, prostate tissue. The other thing you can see is that the, the nucleus, the purple part is kind of away from the lumen. And there's a bunch of uh, white stuff between the nucleus and the lumen, the, the empty space there. Um, and so that tells you this, the nucleus is where it's supposed to be and it's producing the things that a cell is supposed to produce in order to go into that lumen. Particularly, uh, oh my God, I'm blanking on the name. Uh, uh, the, the fluid of semen. Um, so that, um, th those cells are doing what they're doing. This purple blob over here, uh, is Gleason pattern for prostate cancer. Um, and what you can see is, is if I draw a line, you get the kind of pink stuff, uh, the, the stroma, and then I've got a space, and then I've got, you know, cell, 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 maybe a hole, cell, 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 cell maybe a hole, cell, cell, cell. So the, the the cells have lost their program for how to properly mature and divide and do the thing that they're supposed to do. You can also see that it's all very purple. There's a lot of DNA. That's what's in a nucleus of a cell is DNA. Um, and there's not much proteinaceous material. That's the light pink stuff that's uh, over here. It, it's not producing the things it's supposed to produce. It's not following the program it's supposed to follow. Um, and these are all hallmarks of cancer. But what makes a Gleason pattern four is uh, the fact that 
I've got a hole, I've got another hole, I've got another hole, all in one group of things. This is what we call a cribriform pattern. Uh, cribriform basically means it looks like a colander. I don't know if anybody's got a colander at home, but it's you know, got a bunch of holes in it. And it's just like all the same thing with a bunch of holes in it. And that's not normal for normal cells. Uh, so this would be Gleason pattern four. Then over here, we could argue that these littler glands on the far left uh, might be Gleason pattern three. Um, because they're so close to this, I might say they're Gleason pattern four, but uh, we can make an argument that they're Gleason pattern three, and that is they're cancer. They're not uh, attached to the pink stuff. Uh, they're not making this normal protein materials. Uh, there's ap apoptotic figures, uh, DNA debris. Apoptotic figures means a cell that died. Um, and so you have all these features of cancer, but it's not this worse situation where the cells don't even know which end is up anymore. So, hey, Nils, can, can I ask you, okay, sure. so you see some indication of a Gleason 4 and a Gleason 3, but, you know, we hear people being di diagnosed or scored 4 plus 3 or 3 plus 4. So how do you determine which is which? Yeah, so if let's say your entire biopsy just had what we see right here in front of us, ignoring the thumbnail in the upper right there. If I was just looking at this, uh, this would probably be Gleason 4 plus 3. The dominant, the largest area of cancer I see is Gleason pattern 4, and there's a subset of cancer I see that's Gleason pattern 3. So this would be a 4 plus 3. Now let's say, you know, one of the things you'll see in a prostate cancer report is Gleason pattern four plus three in 20% of the core. How do you measure that? Well, let's say this was my entire core biopsy. I didn't bring any core biopsies. I could probably pull one up for you if you want. But um, th this one, you know, if you just measure it across, you'd say probably 30% of it is normal. This kind of 30% over here, the middle third and is prostate is Gleason pattern four and kind of that right third ish is Gleason pattern three. So you'd probably say 70% of one core biopsy. Does that make sense? So kind of the mm -hmm. big one plus the little one. You know, I'm sorry, you know, can I ask you a quick question? Yep. Uh, what is the magnification on this one? Uh, this is a computer generated magnification. So I'm not sure, and I think I turned off. Let's see. Forty X. This would be probably equivalent to a forty X field. Forty X. Okay, thank you. I uh, apologize. I didn't have a. Uh, so, so Niles, uh, Niles, we get an idea. I think of of the subjectivity of of this. How quickly does one does a pathologist look at something like this before he um, makes his conclusion? Uh, so if it's normal, he might spend a fair amount of time or she might spend a fair amount of time on the first pass to make sure they didn't miss anything. Um, if you've already found cancer and you've got a bunch of stuff that looks benign, um, you might quickly go over the benign stuff because you've already found the cancer, you know what that cancer looks like. You know, like uh, once you see a, I'm trying to think of something that people don't see very often. Um, once you see, uh, you know, once someone tells you what a elm tree looks like, you can quickly find a bunch of elm trees, right? Okay. But the next one might look like an oak tree. And if you don't know what an oak tree looks like and you're just looking for elm trees, it's going to take you a while to find that oak tree. So that, that, that once you find the cancer, it, it can go pretty quick. But until you find the cancer, it might take a while, if that makes sense. Okay. And that it can, it can actually end up taking days because um, you might not be sure, and I, I guess I should I should make another deck at some point and just make a survey of different things people see. Ming Zhao 
things out like this is his life he is amazing at this stuff and you guys should ask these questions of him as well uh, tell him i sent my highest regards um but um you might see certain patterns like a, a atypical small acinar perfection is something that some people might see um and in that case you might order a what's called a pin three or a pin four it's an immunohistochemical stain um i gotta got pull some of these kind of things up if people want to see them in, in the questions um but it's a molecular stain to tell you uh to confirm like maybe you only see this tiny little gland over here and you can confirm that it's cancer because if you don't see that big blob in the middle and all you see is that little thing on the side then it's you know it's a little harder to pull the trigger on that and i'm sorry is that a quick question sure um so what what I see right now is on my computer is about three, about four inch by six inch. Suppose uh, if you want to determine percent of tissue involved, normally when you uh, have the biopsy, so after they tell you whether you have three plus four, four plus three, they also give you another value, which is percent uh, tissue involved. Mm -hmm. So in this case, you have a benign on the left side, you have in the middle, four plus three, and then you have a little bit three plus four. So if you compare, if you see this whole tissue, you will consider uh, what, 40% tissue involved? If we were just talking about what's on the screen, I would probably, normally you, if it, you only do this in a, uh, usually only do this in a biopsy setting, um, but it would be, on the, I, in a biopsy setting, I would probably call this a four plus three involving 70% of one core with the provision that this is actually a prostatectomy and that's a whole different issue. Okay, the answer is 70% tissue involved. Yeah, something like that. It just a, It's a straight line measure generally. Thank you. Okay, Thank, thanks for the question. So now uh, it's another question. You, you, If you could go back, yeah. So you said, this big blob in the middle, you would call it a four. Mm -hmm. So, what would what would uh, what would that look like? I guess if as it got higher scores, um, you could make an argument that these single cells up here. Do you see this the cell I'm trying to circle, kind of teardrop pointing to the right? Yeah, uh, and there's a couple of cells next to it, and they're sort of slipping in between the, the, this uh, this pink stuff up here. is called collagen, and uh, it's got some smooth muscle muscle mixed in. Um, but these cells slipping through the stroma individually, uh, you could make an argument it would be Gleason pattern five. I, I can find some Gleason pattern five. Uh, cells for you, if that helps. Um, but it that's that's where you get into, you know, once these things have lost track of what end is up, the, you know, the Gleason pattern four and Gleason pattern five, uh, they're just going all over the place, and they look, they're not even trying to look like a prostate gland anymore. Like this one, the Gleason pattern four, uh, it's got a, a space, it's still trying to form a lumen, right? Over here, the way this works is um, a prostate cell grabs onto the basement membrane. There's this the limiting edge of the pink stuff called the basement membrane, uh, and it's got special desmosome molecules that hold on to the bottom. Uh, and then it's got something called a hemidesmosome, or sorry, it's a desmosome that hold the neighbors and hemidesmosome that hold the basement membrane. The desmosomes are connected to each other, and the hemidesmosomes are connected to the basement membrane. And part of the cell's program is if you don't find a neighbor, die. If you don't find a basement membrane, die, because you're in the wrong place. Um, and then they should be expressing stuff out to this lumen, and they should all agree that uh, the lumen is on the side opposite from the desmos, uh, hemidesmosomes and on not the 
sides with Desmond zones. It should all end up in the middle. Uh, so anything that goes wrong, the cell should die. Um, there's a lot of a lot of your biology is caused by cells saying I should die now. The space between your fingers is because the webbing said I should die now. Holes for your nose, all sorts of things are are there because the middle said I should die now. Um, so these things, they're they're all piled up on top of each other and they have not gotten that death signal. Mm. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah. All right, so I, do, I want to remind everybody um, that my bosses say if you have questions, to put them in the box, and we'll and we'll get to them. Yeah. Sure. Um, I think one version of this actually plays. Yeah, this is awesome. Okay, so um, this is a this is a, a thing you can play with. This is an actual machine. It's going to run in my browser. Um, and this is essentially linear algebra represented with colors, right? So I've got uh, this, uh, let's see if I can, each one of these boxes is matrix, right, uh, of numbers, but we're representing the numbers with colors. And so the way a uh, machine works, it takes a very, a bunch of very simple, uh, patterns recombines them into progressively more complex patterns okay and its confidence of any particular pattern uh, is represented by the density of color and the strength of connection is represented by the strength of the line between each thing okay um, there are other things going on in here but that, that's the general gist is you've got a bunch of matrices all talking to each other and informing each other. And the way this learns is it's going to um, take the difference, the differences and push the differences backward. And that um, uses the um, chain rule uh, from calculus to recalculate uh, the strength of the connections between the lines. So we're going to hit play right here. I can do my... we'll, we'll trust you on the math. Yep. So what you can see over here uh, in the upper right is its learning process. I'm going to pause real quick here. Um, so you've seen uh, it's getting better. That's uh, not testing as well as its training, but it's getting better. And you can start to see that it's starting to find some sort of pattern between the green and the blue, uh, sorry, the orange and the blue. Um, each of these uh, events is an epoch. Uh, let's see if I can scroll this a little bit. Uh, so it's, it's gone through 144 epochs so far. So it's gonna go through a bunch more epochs as it sloshes the information back and forth, that's one epoch. And you can see how these different things would test out if I just used that. I, I can use any one of these to test, but some are better than others. Um, yeah, so we'll let it proceed for a little bit. Now all of a sudden it gets pretty good and then it struggles. I can't figure out why it doesn't quite figure out that last bit. but I will eventually get something figured out that's the right answer. It'll at least get the right answer on the available testing information. Okay, so I, I've successfully separated the, I've found an equation uh, or a system of equations that separates the blue dots from the orange dots and the partition is sort of the white line that separates the two, but you would not have naively drawn whatever this hot mess of an equation is, right? You would have drawn a spiral. I would have drawn a spiral at least. Uh, but it found something and it works. And 
you can imagine I might have some other data in here, like maybe there's something out here that if I tried to test with a blue dot in the lower left corner, it might not work out very well if it landed on that orange wedge. Uh, but I don't have any evidence to the contrary. Um, so th this is essentially your, your last matrix you use, and this is the model you're gonna test with. Okay. So what is, what is it that you're testing for exactly? Yeah, in this one, I'm just, testing, for... I'm just testing. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to find a function that uh, separates, that, that identifies orange dots and blue dots. Uh, that's, that's the whole game here. So if I was trying to test for prostate cancer, I'd need a lot more squares. But this is just a, a thing you can go play around with, playground.tensorflow.org. And this, you can go play around with neural networks. So yeah, I'm sure back. Howard is going to jump over to that playground right away. <laughs> no, I, I got to pay attention here. So okay. a little, little bit later, Hugh, you could lead the way. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see if I can get back to uh, presentation mode. Oh. There we go. Uh, so how do you how do you bridge over from from uh, the Illini colors of orange and blue to prostate cancer? Is it based on color? Is it based on shape? Yeah, so uh, color and shape are two things we call features. Um, and you're trying to discover the features in your whatever your problem space is. So uh, you have features like, uh, where's my, where's my, I have edges and I have uh, other discriminators. I have edges that are closer together, edges that are horizontal, edges that are vertical. I have, um, you know, crossing edges. I have uh, a thin pile of edge that goes to the middle. I've got a little dot in the middle. I've got all sorts of different features in these things. So yes, you're using color and shape and you're using them on many, many different scales all at the same time. So little okay. dots, big dots, dots next to each other, all sorts of stuff. Go ahead. Yeah, so you said you've been working on this for seven years, I think. Yep. And so how have things progressed? You know where where you know where does the science stand right now? Yeah, so let me uh, get to my next slide. Um, so this is a, these are results from 2016. Uh, basically, we're separating uh, things we believe are cancer from things that are not cancer. So all the colors here correspond to colors in the plot, although not very well, to be perfectly honest. Um, like the but anyway, so we're reasonably confident we can identify cancer to about 90%. Uh, where's my cursor again? So about 90% level that we can identify cancer. Um, and inter, if I ask two pathologists, they agree like eh, 70, 80% of the time. So out of the box, sure. the machine's doing pretty good. So is the machine doing better than the, than the pathologists? Uh, would you trust it to... Uh to read uh, read my slides? Uh, not today. I, you know, I, I would be very interested, not, not in particular this machine. Uh, this was trained on 150 cases. They were all sourced from Naval Medical Center, San Diego. They were all, all the circles were done by one person, me. Um, and, and so that wouldn't be very representative. I'd want a machine that was trained by a bunch of pathologists from, with cases from different medical centers. Uh, so I'd be more confident that it's reproducible in a new setting. Let me hear you. But it sounds, sounds like it's doing, what you said made it sound like it was doing better than the pathologist. Yes, but the test set, there's, there's two different sets of data. There's the training set and the test set. So the training set uh, and the test set were all sourced from the same material. So if I gave you a bunch of uh, chips of oak and a bunch of chips of uh, 
elm and taught you the difference, but they, all the oak chips were, for, were from one oak tree, which grew up in Indiana, and all the elm chips were from one elm tree that grew up in France, uh, that might be relatively easy. But if I gave you a bunch of different oaks that grew, you know, some of the oaks are desert oaks from California and others are desert oaks from uh, uh, California and others were uh, great oak trees from Maine. Uh, and maybe I give you some oak trees from France. I give you some elm trees from Alberta or Toronto. Uh, you know, all of a sudden it gets harder. <clears throat> So that, that's sort of the, that's why I would not, that's one of the reasons I would not trust this particular machine that I'm illustrating right here. But it demonstrated that this works, right? I like, I got my lawnmower to turn on. That was an exciting day. Um, so, so now they, so you're doing this specifically on prostate cancer. Then are, are yes. other people doing this on other cancers? Yes. Um, so there's actually, when I started this project, there were uh, like three papers that were vaguely adjacent to what I, I started working on. So it was kind of hard to dream up the first few experiments. But now there's a pretty rich literature uh, and we're uh, fortunate enough to uh, work with a group that's uh, leading, leading uh, the world in this stuff. So that's been helpful. Uh, I'll, Go ahead. Another, another basic question, or maybe an ignorant question: When you get a slide, is there mm -hmm. is there a, is there a chemical that you can put on the slide that will highlight the cancer cells from the normal cells? Yes, that's the purpose of the uh, pin three, and I'll get to. Let me show you some pictures, uh, and we'll I'll talk you through some of that. Okay. Uh, so, be, all right. So this, be patient, uh, Hugh. <laughs> no, it's good though. Uh, uh, all right. So th this is kind of the the first model. Uh, this is some results from the second model, and I got more results in the next slide. Uh, so this is a model that we did train with multiple pathologists. So patholog you can see across the top. And we've got some color coding now. So Gleason pattern three, we agreed would be green and pattern four, we agreed would be yellow and pattern five is red. And so you can see across the top, pathologist one, uh, it's mostly green, or sorry, mostly yellow, pattern four, pathologist two, thought there was some Gleason pattern five mixed in there and probably a little more Gleason pattern three. And uh, the third pathologist thought it was mostly Gleason pattern three, uh, but also some four and some five, and fortunately, their fives tend to be in the same area, so that's a little reassuring. The machine was trained on data slides from three different institutions, and a total of 29 pathologists drew circles. Now you've got a pretty heterogeneous look, um, and this machine is not identifying if you found cancer. This machine is identifying what class of cancer. And so this is Gleason, it's, you know, this weather map on the far right is, uh, you know, confidence that it's three, confidence that it's four, confidence that it's five. Uh, and if you look at it, the Gestalt kind of agrees with how the pathologist anti, if you can kind of like mentally imagine how they might agree, disagree, and discriminate between each other. Um, it it kind of, you know, it's got the reds in the right places. It's got the greens in the right places. It's got the yellows in the right places. It kind of makes sense. That, that's reassuring. So now it's because this is, again, areas that I've never been involved with in that. As you look at the reports from the pathologist one, two, and three, if you just look at that, is that is that a very consistent report, or are you sitting there? Do you conclude, wow, there's big differences in the what this person, what these people have found? Yeah, there's definitely significant differences. So, pathologist one, given just this slide, pathologist one would have said this is Gleason pattern four plus three, minor component of three. Pathologist two would have said this is four plus five. 
right? Pathologist three would have said it's three plus five. So there, those, those lead you down three different pathways. In the, exactly. Right. So the, the central advantage I pause I, I propose for a machine doing this is that your clinical trials are based on a more reproducible standard. So if you want to test new drugs, you want all the drug all the patients to receive this treatment based on the same decider, the same person making a decision. And so they pay pathologists a pretty penny to be the decider uh, in clinical trials, but it's still, it still varies. And in fact, we can separate you know, Canadian pathologists from uh, American pathologists, for example. Um, but the humans wouldn't be able to necessarily sit down and do that, but in the in the machine you can you can see that they've been trained somewhat differently. They've started to separate a little bit based on just geographic batteries, which hopefully the science doesn't change that much across the uh, was it the 38th parallel. Anyway, so um, they get a little bit more into what we have got here. So this machine uh, it's separating on different classes. Um, and so blue is normal, and again, grease pattern three, uh, four, five. So the the middle row and the bottom row go together. So this three, 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 green circle. Oh, my my pointer is off again. Um, sorry. This is uh, three pathologists all said it's grease and pattern three. And the machine, this is a, a distribution, and the machine says, yes, I'm strongly confident that this is Gleason pattern three. And I don't think it's Gleason pattern four, and I definitely don't think it's Gleason pattern five. But if one pathologist thinks that patch is uh, four, then the machine seems more confident that it's four and so on so if you just follow the yellows across i know yellow is not the easiest color for some people to see but if you just follow the yellows across you can see the yellows get bigger when they're all gleason four the you know, strongest that's gleason four and then it fades away and by the time you get to gleason pattern five you know it strongly thinks it's gleason pattern five um and so what you can do what we've done is we've taken a, a what's called a um ordinal variable you know i have i know that three is not as bad as four is not as bad as five but i don't really know how much and there's no meaning to gleason pattern 3.4 but what we've done with this because we have so much data from so many different sources and so many different pathologists you can actually start selecting these and come up with gleason pattern 3.3 and gleason pattern 3.7 and gleason pattern 4.7 so you, you've turned an ordinal variable into a continuous variable by just having access to so much data. So there, there could be a future where you had Gleason pattern 3.4. Mm. Uh, um, let's see, I gotta change my pointer again here. All right, so, but who cares? Who cares if I can do that? Um, well, patients care about their survival. Um, so what we have uh, here is um, reproducibility against a uh, board certified uropathologist and the uropathologist included in this study included Andy Evans uh, in Toronto, uh, Mahul Amin in uh, Tennessee, and uh, uh, I'm pretty sure Ming Zhao is the third. Um, so the machine, which, by the way, was trained by general pathologists, not neuropathologists, outperformed the green uh, general pathologist. So that the student deep learning system learned better than the teachers taught it. That seems interesting to me in and of itself. It's separate from pathology in general, just like the idea that the machine would learn better than the teacher. 
Say that one again. The machine, at least there's a strong signal that the machine probably learned better than the teachers taught it. <laughs> yeah, that's the, the, the issue of education. <laughs> yeah, uh, the student, uh, that's the student every teacher dreams for. Um, all right, so that's the, the A. B, um, there are three sets of lines here. Uh, you have a green set, a blue set, and a red set. The way we've split it is to say there are some low-grade cancers, that is the Gleason group one and Gleason group two, versus the Gleason groups three through five. Okay, and the Gleason group, uh, the low-grade cancers, the Gleason group one and two, are all clustered at the top, and the Gleason, the high-grade cancers, the Gleason grades, or sorry, Gleason groups uh, three through five, they're all clustered at the bottom. What you're interested in is the area between the lines. The area between the green lines, the area between the red lines, the area between the blue lines. And it trends toward the machine, which is red, outperforming the general pathologists, which are green. Right? If I have more separation, that's better. The red lines are farther apart than the green lines, trending that way. Uh, and they tend to maybe even be on par with the subspecialists, you know, the Mahul Amin's of the world, which is very interesting when Mahul Amin is one of the authors on the study. Um, so that, that tends to bode well for patients, that we can give you a better prognostic decision point for your urologist and you to sit in the clinic room and decide whether or not you want to have a prostatectomy or have, you know, brachytherapy or uh, whatever treatment you want to pursue. Um, so that, that was sort of the, the who cares about that. Um, but back to my original problem, and my dad asked me uh, what you should what should I do. Um, the the central issue, as I touched on earlier, was that if I can make the uh, clinical trials uh, more successful, that saves the nation the human race money. Okay. So if I can find biomarkers that uh, are definitely related to the disease, so I can find a protein, a pattern, anything, if I can find anything that uh, I can consistently reproduce in a computer or in a slide or in a test tube, that makes your clinical trials more, more successful. Um, and this is a, this is a studied phenomenon. So that, that's the point of this slide. It's just um, finding biomarkers is a good thing. Um, so the, what are the biomarkers for active surveillance? Um, I've got a kind of upper limit, um, and this is not the area I study. So it's a quick dive into the literature. But you've got the 4K score, which is, uses um, various versions of PSA values, as well as the uh, human calicrine 2, um, and then age, rectal exam, and prior biopsy results. Uh, you've also got you know, prostate health index, uh, some others. And, and if you go to the actual guidelines, and this is a link to the guidelines, which I'm not going to click right now, um, but you know, it all comes down to, given those things, uh, you, know, you have these choices. And it'll come down to pretty much, uh, you know, if your uh, survival is, you know, greater than 20 years, uh, you can have pretty much any therapy you want. Uh, you can go six, you know, PSA uh, every six, no, no more than every six months, and uh, maybe biopsies no more than every year. And 10 to 20 years is kind of the same thing. And if your survival is less than 10 years, it's pretty much the same thing. Uh, because there's there's no great like like you can get to any of these outcomes in any of the slides because it's hard to know because of this reproducibility problem 
this reproducibility problem makes it hard for the urologists to do effective investigations. If I can't, if, I, if you ask me a question and I give you a random answer, it makes you really hard for you. Uh, if you're asking me, did you mow the lawn? And I say, yes. The next time I say no, it makes, you start wondering like, does this guy know what he's talking about? Um, it also makes you very hard to decide whether or not you should mow the lawn, right? Aside from whether or not you think I know what I'm talking about, it makes you hard for you to decide if you're gonna mow the lawn. So this is something of an area called test statistics. How do you evaluate a test? Uh, and so again, there's something called, what's called a receiver operator character. The way a receiver operator characteristic curve works is, is they came from radar operators in uh, England during the blitz. They had these new radars to see if they had incoming bombers from Germany. And some of the operators were really good at identifying airplanes. And some of the operators could not tell airplanes from clouds from birds. And so they were very sensitive or very specific and the best ones were both sensitive and specific. So how do you measure that? So you put sensitivity on the vertical and you put specificity on the horizontal and then you plot points for where everybody falls out. So we do this for essentially every um, test, any test that goes into production, whether it's a medical test, uh, I, I work at Defense Innovation Unit, I apply the same standards for um, drones, uh, you know, all sorts of AI algorithms for other things, uh, you know, uh, battle damage assessment with uh, satellite data, uh, all, all sorts of things we calculate rock curves for. So these are just some examples of different rock curves. Uh, so in the upper left is the troponins rock curve. This is for heart attacks. That's a pretty good rock curve, okay? It's, it's, very, it's very sensitive and very specific. Uh, for beta HCG, uh, this is, for, you know, women who are pregnant, uh, and particularly the worst case scenario is something called a molar pregnancy, which I don't want to get into right now, but uh, it, it's, a, it's a bad thing. But basically, uh, if you have a high HCG, you're probably on a molar pregnancy, and you're, if you have a high HCG but you're not pregnant, you probably have a molar pregnancy. Um, so that's pretty good. Not great, but okay. Um, for radiologists identifying breast cancer, just based on shadows on an x-ray, radiologists tend to do equivalent to this specialized molecular assay, which isn't that much worse than troponins for a heart attack. Like that's a high stakes game. Everybody's interested in solving that problem and they found a really good solution to it. Prostate biomarkers, the best prostate biomarker is worse than the worst line of those top three tests. So it's it it's not exactly a solved problem. And the best the best biomarker for prostate is what the PSA. Uh, it looks like based on this curve, it's uh, PSA versus PHI two, prostate health index two. But you know that's still okay at best. Oh, maybe the green. There's two different shades of green on here, and it's a little bright over here. So maybe that was uh, percent P2 PSA, so the change in uh, PSA values. So, okay. Yeah. So anyway, th those are probably your best options. Uh, but, you know, if I'm evaluating across the medical system, uh, you know, prostate's not winning the ball game on this one. Um, so there's room to find better biomarkers. This, all this blank space in the upper right or upper left side of the prostate biomarkers is just asking for a better biomarker to be found. Uh, let's see. So if I click, all right. So let, this gets into the methodologies that I was using to find new biomarkers. So I'm going to go through two of these. One is called a tissue microarray, and I'm going to walk you through how I build a tissue microarray, and the other one is a um, uh, laser capture microdissection. 
So yeah, this Niels, is, I, uh, if I could mention that we need to keep some time for questions. So, yep, I'll, I'll quickly blow through this. So this, this is a, a, a prostate needle or prostate uh, prostatectomy, uh, and the machine that you see here is going to take a core biopsy out of that. Uh, and, and this happens to be the same one that I used for the other thing. So, uh, you know, what I did is is have this up on a screen and I have to kind of reimagine where I should take the core biopsies out. Um, and so you can see a core biopsy and then I take that and I put it in a, a blank matrix. Uh, and then I build out a whole set of these biopsies taken from remnant tissue and then I stain them. And someone was asking if there's a stain that was chemical that can show you where the cancer is. So this is a particular one called Amicar, uh, alpha methyl coacyl Um And the brown ones, it, it's highly upregulated in cancer. So this is a test slide. Uh, and the brown ones are cancer. The blue ones are generally not cancer. There's some benign expression of Amicar. So some of these you might see uh, some brown, but it's still like... Uh, this this one up here is probably not, but it's still got a little bit of brown. Okay. So this is a tissue microarray. So I've got a whole bunch of cancers from a whole bunch of different people. I take some uh, normal tissue along with it, and you know you've basically got a study on a single glass slide. I can just count up how many had cancer, how many didn't have cancer. Uh, sorry, cancer. good question. Go uh, what diameter of the dot? About one millimeter. Uh, these are two millimeter cores. Um, so the, what I, what I, the plan was initially, uh, was you, you could take one of these and you could cut a whole bunch of sections, you know, five microns and say it's three millimeters thick. You know, I can get 300 slides. Even if I waste half the tissue, I can get 300 slides. That means I can test 300 biomarkers. The problem is if I have 300 slides and I have 200 cores on a slide. Now I've got 60,000 spots to look at. So my original problem, the reason I wanted a machine that would diagnose cancer for me was because I was contemplating having to look at 60,000 spots, which is a lot of spots, even for a resident. Um, and a machine would help me with that. Um, so I was just trying to identify new biomarkers so I could help your urologist fill in the upper left side of this curve, right? Uh, and ended up with this other problem of trying to identify cancer. This other process is called laser capture microdissection. Similarly, you've got tissue that you're looking edge on uh, the way this is originally set up, you kind of have to imagine these upside down. Uh, they have a glass slide and you put uh, um, polyethylene on the slide and then you put the tissue very just just like uh, just like this tissue, uh, the thin glass slide version. This is five micron thick slide. Um, you put a five micron or 10 micron thick slide uh, section of tissue on here and then uh, I'll show you the other version of this uh, in a second here. You use a laser to burn away the polyethylene, and then the tissue falls into the uh, Eppendorf, uh, and then you can take that away to do uh, sequencing by synthesis, you know, with these Illumina genetic sequencing machines, or uh, mass spectrometry. Um, those are kind of the two big popular options. Uh, so what you do is, you, again, you have the same slide, uh, and you are drawing circles around where the cancer is, right? And then you take some other sections of where that stroma was. I was talking about the pink stuff. Um, and then you use that tissue from the laser capture microdissection to go look for all the proteins and all the genes, and hopefully you find a biomarker that reproducibly identifies cancer. Well, drawing these circles takes a lot of time, right? Just like me, way back when I was drawing these circles, this took this took months to draw all these circles. You can't do that in a clinical workflow. It just doesn't make any sense. Um, so 
this is something that's currently only done on a research basis. Uh, very, very few labs will do this for diagnostic purposes. Um, but a couple of my collaborators got together with some other folks in the, in the space and uh, trained a machine to work on this tissue, and this happens to be a prostate. Um, so they've got a machine that'll identify the prostate cancer, and then uh, you don't have to pay a pathologist $200 an hour to draw that circle. That's a huge cost savings for the biomedical research industry. Um, so those are, those are the couple of uh, use cases. You know, I've got the diagnostic use cases as well as the research use cases for these things. And that concludes my presentation. I think I got 15 minutes. Ah, yeah. Okay. Um, right. Now, you, you said in the beginning that uh, you had some questions for us, the patients. And so when, uh, maybe you can ask us a couple questions and some of the other moderators can come back at you with the questions from the peanut gallery. Thank you. Um, so one question I have, and this is maybe something for you guys to discuss and, and kind of get back and how do, you, how do you want to answer this kind of question. but um, one of the things that we do is we de-identify all this uh, data before we use it for research. And the reason we do that is because um, we have to, in order to meet the requirements uh, put on it, um, and I, I guess my question is, if I, uh, could associate your other data, like if I could uh, take your name and go into the medical record and find all the other information about you that's in the medical record, like you know, how often do you go to the doctor and did you go to the doctor in Wyoming or did you go to a doctor in Texas? Um, and you know, did you get seen once a year, once every six years? Or you know, how, what were your PSA values over time? Um, yeah, I, I guess the question is, how many people would be okay with their information being used, uh, um, either identified or not identified, for research? Um, I asked the question because this was actually uh, litigated uh, in a University of Washington case, um, and I'll. I'll you, know, you guys can do the homework and, and find the answer because I don't want to bias you too much. Uh, but uh, there, there is an answer in the record, and so we can do what we do. Uh, but I didn't have to ask for consent from the patients to do this, right? It's like some of them, you know, if you use an archival tissue from 10 years ago, some of them are dead just because they aged out for other reasons. Um, but that, that's an interesting question I would have for, for folks. Is, yeah, is, you, you know, I have some opinions on that, that it may depend on the personality of the individual. There's some people that are very uh, research oriented, very open, and there's some people that are very uh, tight with their information. And, you know, I think, I think you may have 30 different answers. Joe, what do you think? You probably would go for it. You're on a spot there. You never know. Yeah. So what, what other questions? Anybody else want to respond to the doctor? I mean, I would think uh, the the availability of information, uh, it's, it's what you're going to do with it and how are you going to publicly release it. You know, if you, if I gave you my data and you kept it and, you know, even if you turned it me into patient A and you uh, shared patient A's information with with another doctor or whatever, I don't I don't see how that you know I couldn't couldn't see how that that ha has any bearing on what my my data happens. But you know today people are are very weirded out with uh, with with data and. Um, where the data goes. You know, Hugh, would you be concerned about security? And, you know, I, I know some younger people who've been 
you know, diagnosed and been on active surveillance. And they, they were very private about their information. They, the guy figured his mother would be dead and he didn't, you know, before, before he ever got into any trouble. So he kept the information to himself. So. Yeah. I myself, I'm not so worried as, as, as others on, on that. So um, we might get to some questions here. Uh, Woody said, if you got sent your biopsy tissues to uh, three genomic companies, uh, somatic gene mutations, how would the samples get affected between each genomic testing company? Yeah, that's a great question. So tumor heterogeneity is the general class of problem. So um, where's my slides here? So if I send them this blob in the middle, or they laser dissect this blob in the middle, uh, they might see one pattern of uh, genes because uh, cancer is a it's a it's essentially an information catastrophe where you end up with lots of uh, uh, genetic information that's duplicated maybe 70 or 100 or a thousand times uh, and you have other stuff that's completely lost and then you know if I sent them I'm uh, sorry uh, can I clarify my question sure so meaning that if you send this sample to the first company and then they punch the hole. For example, yeah. this uh, uh, round uh, four plus three, mm -hmm. and then um, then they give you a genomic score. For example, this one probably uh, very high. Suppose uh, with the decipher company, in that case, in real case, my case, they say this is a uh, high risk. So then uh, you were uh, kind of not sure. Is it correct? Then you send to the second one, which is the in, in real life. So I sent to Uncle Type, and then they told me that I'm on the low risk. Yep. So meaning that they probably do not look at the same sample. Yep. Besides, I mean, uh, the worst one is already taken by the first company. Yeah, the, the, the companies definitively did not look at the same thing because usually they didn't what, have the same cell. Usually the company, they told me that the uh, pathologists of each company, they look for the worst one. From the sample that you have, right. suppose the worst one is taken from the first company, then the second company will not get the worst one. Am I correct? Right. And again, the pathologist, where where where'd my uh, other slide go here? Which pathologist looked at it may decide whether or not they think that was the worst area. Oh, in my case, I mean, I only, as a matter of fact, only send it to company. The first company said I have a high risk, and the yep. second company said it is a low risk. Yep. So uh, yeah. I questioned them to find out which sample they're looking at. So yeah, they said it, the, the, the particular sample that I mentioned is supposed to be the worst one. Uh, the uh, tissue amount is depleted. Yeah, that's also a problem. So. Um, hmm. So I thought, that, I thought that the uh, genomic test is not testing for the uh, quantity of the of the tissue, but maybe the type. Right. So particularly in the same area, yep. it can so it could be a separate answer. One's a high risk, the other one's a low low risk. Right. So the, there may be, for example, I could take this core, right, from this is about the size of a prostate cancer biopsy. I could take the top section, which you know is two millimeters, and I could send that to one company, and they would come up with one answer. A millimeter down or half a millimeter down, I could send that section to another company. There may not be any cancer left. It might be depleted, like they said. Uh, and they may not have enough tissue to – they might say there's plenty of tissue, but there's not enough cancer tissue, and they just might just reject the specimen. Uh, in the middle, they might say, well, uh, the worst thing I can find in here is 3 plus 3, and I think you're a low risk. Uh, 
but we'll run the assay and the assay comes back low risk and they say, well, our, our results are concordant because visually we thought it was a three plus three and the molecular analysis thought it was a low risk. And so we think you have a low risk cancer. We can't tell you anything about what happened at the top. So you're, just, you're saying, you're saying that uh, there's problems in the samples, but, but there's also interoperator differences, aren't there? I mean, even the best, um, <clears throat> the best pathologists. What is it? Is it like about a twenty percent error rate? Yeah, uh, and uh, there's a even a there's what's called a pre-analytical difference before they ever get the sample to analyze. Which sample they got to analyze was was an issue. So. So should we turn our fates over to an AI machine? Uh, <clears throat> or, you know, I mean, is it, it just seems like so many things can go wrong with these uh, biopsy samples. I mean, what are we supposed to do with that? Um, well, yeah, so I, I own a Tesla. I don't know if anybody here okay. owns a Tesla. I guess, I'm sorry, I guess my question is that uh, when you send a sample to the first uh, company, let's say disciple, they punch the hole, right? So the yeah. vac. Well, first of all, you send a biopsy sample in the uh, 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 formalin box, right? So the company uh, pathology will look for the worst one, and they decided that the one that they will use for the uh, the somatic uh, gene mutation test, right? right? So they punch the hole in the uh, the area. And, and that that is uh, looked the worst in the 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 the, the optical uh, microscope by the pathologist, right? Right. So they punch that and then they analyze that. So this is what I suspect. The first company found that okay, that's a high risk, right? And I want a second opinion. So I asked the uh, hospital to send to the second one. So now that particular sample is already got a hole in there. So it's a vacuum break, right? So can I assume that when you have a vacuum break, the, um, it might alter the, uh, the biochemical or biostructures of the tissue. So by the time it gets into the second uh, so, sonomic company, like Oncotype, then there might uh, get the result differently. Even though it's oh, from the, the adjacent the area, action, the mere action of putting a hole in the tissue may have affected the adjacent result. Correct, because you break the vacuum, right? Right. So if you're thinking about oxidation, correct, uh, or something get to it. Yeah, I, I cannot exclude oxidation as a source of pre-analytical variability. Yeah, the reason I, I say that very critical because. Uh, I, I am considered as an intermediate, right? So it determines whether I'm a favorable or unfavorable. So the first one got the tissue sample first, the cipher. So they say that you're on the high risk, uh, 6, 0.65, right? But then when you go to the second one, it said that you're on the 22 range, which is uncle type way of uh, give you a score equivalent to the low risk. So now you determine Try to determine whether you're high risk or, or low risk. <laughs> so that's affect the treatment. Yeah, yeah it, 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 uh, really uh, it's, a, it's a hard problem, and I'm sorry that you have to deal with that. Um, but it, it is welcome to pathology. Yeah, there but can no I ask you a quick question? So you say well, that you excuse, really excuse me. I think. Can I? Other I'm sorry, who... the last, last quick question. You think that I can send to the third company? I, I I don't know what your tissue looks like, sir. What, what, what do you, what do you, we can't we, we really can't give personal um, responses on some of these. We've got to keep them fairly generic uh, because otherwise, what you know, we get into be giving a medical advice, and that's not really you know if if you can obviously opt to send it to the uh, to a third company to see what their response would be. Thanks. You, uh, so 
Hugh, are there some other questions? Because our clock is running out here. Uh, I've no. got a quick question. Go ahead, uh, Jim. Um, do you have any prediction of, of a time frame as to when this would roll out to uh, clinical practice? And at the outset, what is that going to look like? Are they going to be sending slides for um, this uh, machine learning analysis and and have a simultaneous reading by a pathologist? Um, how do you how do you think this is going to roll out and really become practical and useful for patients? Yeah, so um, the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center has a validated protocol. Um, by a, uh, developed by a guy named Leron Pantanowicz, uh, excellent pathologist, who um, deployed a IBIS system. So it does the machine learning after the pathologist diagnosis. And so it has that you know, all good ratchet effect that if a pathologist missed something, the machine found, finds it, flags it, and says, hey, you should think about this again. But it happens after the pathologist did their thing. Uh, and so there's no downside to it. That I, I think is a very promising way to do business in this particular realm. Um, I personally in the military uh, work on a lot of things where you want a machine to help faster. So we're working on some um, ways to do this ahead of the pathologist. Um, that needs some more clinical validation. I, I don't think you're gonna see those uh, deployed at scale for some years. Um, I think you will see small deployments like UPMC uh, rolling out in sort of a, a flurry of activity as people figure out how to do this. Thank you. Any other last questions? Well, I had a one one comment here for it now, and that is, uh, I think your presentation has 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 once again um, showed uh, showed us the um, po positivity uh, that we have as an active surveillance group because um, you're reiterating how, as a patient, you need to be so active in this. Uh, in this realm, because the pathologists and and you know we rely tremendously on the biopsy, and there's a lot of subjectivity here. What what did you go to your father? And what was the advice? And that that you how many pathologists did you have your father uh, get, get read uh, his slides? On the first one, uh, he had a three plus three in a single core. Um, and so, uh, watchful waiting was, was, uh, where, we, um, and on the second one, it was, I want to say three plus four in two, three plus three in one core and three plus four in a directed core from MRI. Uh, and at that point he was 75 and elected to just let it be. Um, but that was done. Yeah, he didn't really go to a second, he didn't get a second look on that biopsy so much as he went to MD Anderson for the second biopsy. So he got a second opinion that way, if that makes sense. Okay. But it was sort of like, it's moving along the kind of what you'd expect uh, got a little bit worse. Niels, is your father still still alive? Yeah, he was uh, supposed to be here tonight, but um, he, we actually met up for a vacation in Tahoe, and he's uh, driving back to Texas right now. So he sends his regards and regrets. Well, we send our, our regards to him. That's good, good to know. So, gentlemen, should we call it a night, or are there any last questions? Sorry, the last question, uh, uh, Dr. Olson, can you go back to the slide that on your x-axis, there's a number of year, and the y-axis, 
uh, you have uh, the, the different, uh, yeah, that's math. Yes, yes. So uh, can I assume that when, as the year go by, 6, 8, 10, 12, you have more experience. So you can see a different, you can differentiate better compared to the first few years, you bundle them up. You cannot tell whether it's a, a recent grade one, two or three, but at the time by, you can differentiate the better. So and these are, so these are looking, um, the way we did this is we pulled slides from your back uh, 12 years. Um, so, you, you know, it's not like you had 300 patients and followed them all forward. It's that you had varying amounts of data over time for varying patients. Yeah, these are the experience of the specialists, right? As the time go by, year seven, year eight, 10, 12, you can see. Yeah, the, so, so like the, on the, the year 12, let's say this, let's say this uh, graph is from 2000, uh, hang on, we finished, capped at 2016. So if you go backwards from 2016, the, uh, the, the, the first patient is probably the, you know, 13 years out. So that would have been 2003. The first data points on here are probably from 2003 or so. And the ones up at 1.0 and zero years, those are from 2016. Okay. And so we have the survival kind of looking backwards. Um, so probably we know uh, the, in some ways we know more about the people from 20, or 2003, but they had access to less research than we do in 2016. Thank you, Dr. Olson. Good question, thank you. So, Niels, uh, appreciate your stopping by. Uh, yeah, I, th I think we learned a lot and uh, appreciate it. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot. We, we're, we had to pull you away from your vacation. No, no, I, I got home. It was, it was, I actually uh, uh, skipped that on Howard because I was on a mountain, mountain biking. So, apologize. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Thank you. Moderator Thank you. team, please hang around. <laughs>